Chapter Fourteen, Part Two of Trent's Last Case. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Trent's Last Case, Chapter Fourteen, Double Cunning, Part Two. I had started and turned the car. I was already going fast when I heard the sound of a shot in front of me to the right. Instantly, I stopped the car. My first wild thought was that Manderson was shooting at me. Then I realized that the noise had not been close at hand. I could see nobody on the road, though the moonlight flooded it. I had left Manderson at a spot just round a corner that was now some fifty yards ahead of me. I started again and turned the corner at a slow pace. Then I stopped again with a jar, and for a moment I sat perfectly still. Manderson lay dead, a few steps from me, on the turf within the gate, clearly visible to me in the moonlight. Marlowe made another pause, and Trent, with a puckered brow, inquired, "'On the golf course?' "'Obviously,' remarked Mr. Cupples, "'the eighth green is just there.' He had grown more and more interested as Marlowe went on, and was now playing feverishly with his thin beard. "'On the green, quite close to the flag,' said Marlowe. He lay on his back, his arms were stretched abroad, his jacket and heavy overcoat were open, the light shone hideously on his white face, and his shirt-front, it glistened on his bared teeth and one of the eyes, the other, you saw it. The man was certainly dead. As I sat there, stunned, unable for the moment to think at all, I could even see a thin, dark line of blood running down from the shattered socket to the ear. Close by lay his soft black hat, and at his feet a pistol. I suppose it was only a few seconds that I sat helplessly staring at the body, then I rose and moved to it with dragging feet, for the truth had come to me at last, and I realized the fullness of my appalling danger. It was not only my liberty or my honor that the maniac had undermined, it was death that he had planned for me, death with the degradation of the scaffold. To strike me down with certainty, he had not hesitated to end his life a life which was, no doubt, already threatened by a melancholic impulse to self-destruction, and the last agony of the suicide had been turned, perhaps, to a devilish joy by the thought that he dragged down my life with his. For, so far as I could see at the moment, my situation was utterly hopeless. If it had been desperate, on the assumption that Manderson meant to denounce me as a thief, what was it now that his corpse denounced me as a murderer? I picked up the revolver and saw, almost without emotion, that it was my own. Manderson had taken it from my room, I suppose, while I was getting out the car. At the same moment I remembered that it was by Manderson's suggestion that I had had it engraved with my initials, to distinguish it from a precisely similar weapon which he had of his own. I bent over the body, and satisfied myself that there was no life left in it. I must tell you here that I did not notice, then or afterwards, the scratches and marks on the wrists which were taken as evidence of a struggle with an assailant. But I have no doubt that Manderson deliberately injured himself in this way before firing the shot. It was a part of his plan. Though I never perceived that detail, however, it was evident enough, as I looked at the body that Manderson had not forgotten in his last act on earth, to tie me tighter by putting out of court the question of suicide. He had clearly been at pains to hold the pistol at arm's length, and there was not a trace of smoke or of burning on the face. The wound was absolutely clean, and was already ceasing to bleed outwardly. I rose and paced the green, 
reckoning up the points in the crushing case against me. I was the last to be seen with Manderson. I had persuaded him, so he had lied to his wife, and, as I afterwards knew to the butler, to go with me for the drive, from which he never returned. My pistol had killed him. It was true that by discovering his plot I had saved myself from heaping up further incriminating facts, flight, concealment, the possession of the treasure. But what need of them, after all? As I stood, what hope was there? What could I do? Marlowe came to the table and leaned forward with his hands upon it. "'I want,' he said very earnestly, to try to make you understand what was in my mind when I decided to do what I did. I hope you won't be bored, because I must do it. You may both have thought I acted like a fool, but, after all, the police never suspected me. I walked that green for a quarter of an hour, I suppose, thinking the thing out, like a game of chess. I had to think ahead and think coolly, for my safety depended on upsetting the plans of one of the longest-headed men who ever lived. And remember that, for all I knew, there were details of the scheme still hidden from me, waiting to crush me. Two plain courses presented themselves at once. Either of them, I thought, would certainly prove fatal. I could in the first place do the completely straightforward thing, take back the dead man, tell my story, hand over the notes and diamonds, and trust to the saving power of truth and innocence. I could have laughed as I thought of it. I saw myself bringing home the corpse, and giving an account of myself, boggling with sheer shame over the absurdity of my wholly unsupported tale, as I brought a charge of mad hatred and fiendish treachery against a man who had never, so far as I knew, had a word to say against me. At every turn the cunning of Manderson had forestalled me. His careful concealment of such a hatred was a characteristic feature of the stratagem. Only a man of his iron self-restraint could have done it. You can see for yourselves how every fact in my statement would appear, in the shadow of Manderson's death, a clumsy lie. I tried to imagine myself telling such a story to the counsel for my defence. I could see the face with which he would listen to it. I could read in the lines of it his thought that to put forward such an impudent farrago would mean merely the disappearance of any chance there might be of a commutation of the capital sentence. True, I had not fled. I had brought back the body. I had handed over the property. But how did that help me? It would only suggest that I had yielded to a sudden funk after killing my man, and had no nerve left to clutch at the fruits of the crime. It would suggest, perhaps, that I had not set out to kill, but only to threaten, and that when I found that I had done murder, the heart went out of me. Turn it which way I would, I could see no hope of escape by this plan of action. The second of the obvious things that I might do was to take the hint offered by the situation and to fly at once. That, too, must prove fatal. There was the body. I had no time to hide it in such a way that it would not be found at the first systematic search, but whatever I should do with the body, Manderson's not returning to the house would cause uneasiness in two or three hours at most. Martin would suspect an accident to the car, and would telephone to the police. At daybreak the roads would be scoured, and inquiries telegraphed in every direction. The police would act on the possibility of there being foul play. They would spread their nets with energy in such a big business as the disappearance of Manderson. Ports and railway termini would be watched. Within twenty-four hours the body would be found— and the whole country would be on the alert for me, all across Europe scarcely less. I did not believe there was a spot in Christendom where the man accused of Manderson's murder could pass unchallenged, 
with every newspaper crying the fact of his death into the ears of all the world, every stranger would be suspected. Every man, woman, and child would be a detective. The car, wherever I should abandon it, would put people on my track. If I had to choose between two utterly hopeless courses, I decided, I would take that of telling the preposterous truth. But now I cast about desperately for some tale that would seem more plausible than the truth. Could I save my neck by a lie? One after another came into my mind. I need not trouble to remember them now. Each had its own futilities and perils, but every one split upon the fact, or what would be taken for the fact, that I had induced Manderson to go out with me, and the fact that he had never returned alive. Notion after notion I swiftly rejected, as I paced there by the dead man, and doom seemed to settle down upon me more heavily as the moments passed, and then a strange thought came to me. Several times I had repeated to myself, half unconsciously as a sort of refrain, the words in which I had heard Manderson tell his wife that I had induced him to go out. Marlowe has persuaded me to go for a moonlight run in the car. He is very urgent about it. All at once it struck me that, without meaning to do so, I was saying this in Manderson's voice. As you found out for yourself, Mr. Trent, I have a natural gift of mimicry. I had imitated Manderson's voice many times, so successfully as to deceive even Bunner, who had been much more in his company than his own wife. It was, you remember, Marlowe turned to Mr. Cupples, a strong metallic voice of great carrying power, so unusual as to make it a very fascinating voice to imitate, and at the same time very easy. I said the words carefully to myself again like this. He uttered them, and Mr. Cupples opened his eyes in amazement. And then I struck my hand upon the low wall beside me. Manderson never returned alive, I said aloud, but Manderson shall return alive. In thirty seconds the bare outline of my plan was completed in my mind. I did not wait to think over details. Every instant was precious now. I lifted the body and laid it on the floor of the car, covered with a rug. I took the hat and the revolver. Not one trace remained on the green, I believe, of that night's work. As I drove back to White Gables, my design took shape before me with a rapidity and ease that filled me with a wild excitement. I should escape yet. It was all so easy, if I kept my pluck. Putting aside the unusual and unlikely, I should not fail. I wanted to shout, to scream. Nearing the house, I slackened speed, and carefully reconnoitred the road. Nothing was moving. I turned the car into the open field, on the other side of the road, about twenty paces short of the little door, at the extreme corner of the grounds. I brought it to rest behind a stack, when, with Manderson's hat on my head, and the pistol in my pocket, I had staggered with the body across the moonlit road, and through that door, I left much of my apprehension behind me. With swift action and an unbroken nerve, I thought I ought to succeed. With a long sigh, Marlowe threw himself into one of the deep chairs at the fireside, and passed his handkerchief over his damp forehead. Each of his hearers, too, drew a deep breath, but not audibly. "'Everything else you know,' he said. He took a cigarette from a box beside him and lighted it. Trent watched the very slight quiver of the hand that held the match, and privately noted that his own, at the moment, was not so steady. "'The shoes that betrayed me to you,' pursued Marlowe, after a short silence, "'were painful all the time I wore them. But I never dreamed that they had given anywhere. 
I knew that no footstep of mine must appear by any accident in the soft ground about the hut where I lay the body, or between the hut and the house, so I took the shoes off and crammed my feet into them as soon as I was inside the little door. I left my own shoes, with my own jacket and overcoat near the body, ready to be resumed later. I made a clear footmark on the soft gravel outside the French window, and several on the drugget round the carpet, the stripping off of the outer clothing of the body, and the dressing of it afterwards in the brown suit and shoes, and putting the things into the pockets was a horrible business, and getting the teeth out of the mouth was worse. The head—but you don't want to hear about it. I didn't feel it much at the time. I was wriggling my own head out of a noose, you see. I wish I had thought of pulling down the cuffs and had tied the shoes more neatly. And putting the watch in the wrong pocket was a bad mistake. It had all to be done so hurriedly. You were wrong, by the way, about the whisky. After one stiffish drink, I had no more, but I filled up the flask that was in the cupboard and pocketed it. I had a night of peculiar anxiety and effort in front of me, and I didn't know how I should stand it. I had to take some once or twice during the drive. Speaking of that, you gave rather a generous allowance of time in your document for doing that run by night. You say that to get to Southampton by half-past six in that car, under the conditions, a man must, even if he drove like a demon, have left Marlstone by twelve at latest. I had not got the body dressed in the other suit, with tie and watch-chain and so forth, until nearly ten minutes past, and then I had to get to the car and started going, but then I don't suppose any demon would have taken the risks I did in that car at night without a headlight. It turns me cold to think of it now. There's nothing much to say about what I did in the house. I spent the time after Martin had left me in carefully thinking over the remaining steps in my plan, while I unloaded and thoroughly cleaned the revolver, using my handkerchief and a penholder from the desk, I also placed the packets of notes, the note-case and the diamonds, in the roll-top desk, which I opened and relocked with Manderson's key. When I went upstairs, it was a trying moment, for though I was safe from the eyes of Martin, as he sat in his pantry, there was a faint possibility of somebody being about on the bedroom floor. I had sometimes found the French maid wandering about there when the other servants were in bed. Bunner, I knew, was a deep sleeper. Mrs. Manderson, I had gathered from things I had heard her say, was usually asleep by eleven. I had thought it possible that her gift of sleep had helped her to retain all her beauty and vitality, in spite of a marriage which we all knew was an unhappy one. Still, it was uneasy work mounting the stairs and holding myself ready to retreat to the library again at the least sound from above. But nothing happened. The first thing I did on reaching the corridor was to enter my room and put the revolver and cartridges back in the case. Then I turned off the light and went quietly into Manderson's room. What I had to do there, you know. I had to take off the shoes and put them outside the door, leave Manderson's jacket, waistcoat, trousers, and black tie, after taking everything out of the pockets, select a suit and tie and shoes for the body, and place the dental plate in the bowl, which I moved from the washing-stand to the bedside, leaving those ruinous finger-marks as I did so. The marks on the drawer must have been made when I shut it after taking out the tie. Then I had to lie down in the bed and tumble it. You know all about it, all except my state of mind, which you couldn't imagine and I couldn't describe. The worst came when I had hardly begun my operations, the moment when Mrs. Manderson spoke from the room where I supposed her asleep. I was prepared for it happening, it was a possibility, 
but I nearly lost my nerve all the same. However, by the way, I may tell you this, in the extremely unlikely contingency of Mrs. Manderson remaining awake, and so putting out of the question my escape by way of her window, I had planned simply to remain where I was a few hours, and then, not speaking to her, to leave the house quickly and quietly by the ordinary way. Martin would have been in bed by that time. I might have been heard to leave, but not seen. I should have done just as I had planned with the body, and then made the best time I could in the car to Southampton. The difference would have been that I couldn't have furnished an unquestionable alibi by turning up at the hotel at six-thirty. I should have made the best of it by driving straight to the docks and making my ostentatious inquiries there. I could, in any case, have got there long before the boat left at noon. I couldn't see that anybody could suspect me of the supposed murder in any case, but if any one had, and if I hadn't arrived until ten o'clock, say, I shouldn't have been able to answer, it is impossible for me to have got to Southampton so soon after shooting him. I should simply have had to say I was delayed by a breakdown after leaving Manderson at half-past ten, and challenged any one to produce any fact connecting me with the crime. They couldn't have done it. The pistol, left openly in my room, might have been used by anybody, even if it could be proved that that particular pistol was used. Nobody could reasonably connect me with the shooting, so long as it was believed that it was Manderson who had returned to the house. The suspicion could not, I was confident, enter anyone's mind. All the same, I wanted to introduce the element of absolute physical impossibility. I knew I should feel ten times as safe with that. So when I knew from the sound of her breathing that Mrs. Manderson was asleep again, I walked quickly across her room in my stocking feet, and was on the grass with my bundle in ten seconds. I don't think I made the least noise. The curtain before the window was of soft, thick stuff, and didn't rustle, and when I pushed the glass doors further open there was not a sound. "'Tell me,' said Trent, as the other stopped to light a new cigarette, "'why you took the risk of going through Mrs. Manderson's room to escape from the house. I could see, when I looked into the thing on the spot, why it had to be on that side of the house. There was a danger of being seen by Martin or by some servant at a bedroom window if you got out by a window on one of the other sides.' but there were three unoccupied rooms on that side, two spare bedrooms, and Mrs. Manderson's sitting-room. I should have thought it would have been safer, after you had done what was necessary to your plan in Manderson's room, to leave it quietly and escape through one of those three rooms. The fact that you went through her window, you know, he added coldly, might have suggested, if it became known, a certain suspicion in regard to the lady herself. I think you understand me. Marlowe turned upon him with a glowing face. And I think you will understand me, Mr. Trent, he said in a voice that shook a little, when I say that if such a possibility had occurred to me then, I would have taken any risk rather than make my escape by that way. Oh, well, he went on more coolly, I suppose that to any one who didn't know her, the idea of her being privy to her husband's murder might not seem so indescribably fatuous. Forgive the expression. He looked attentively at the burning end of his cigarette, studiously unconscious of the red flag that flew in Trent's eyes for an instant at his words and the tone of them. That emotion, however, was conquered at once. "'Your remark is perfectly just,' Trent said, with answering coolness. "'I can quite believe, too, that at the time you didn't think of the possibility I mentioned. But surely, apart from that, it would have been safer to do as I said, go by the window of an unoccupied room.' "'Do you think so?' said Marlowe. "'All I can say 
is I hadn't the nerve to do it. I tell you, when I entered Manderson's room, I shut the door of it on more than half my terrors. I had the problem confined before me in a closed space, with only one danger in it, and that a known danger, the danger of Mrs. Manderson. The thing was almost done. I had only to wait until she was certainly asleep, after her few moments of waking up, for which, as I told you, I was prepared as a possibility. Barring accidents, the way was clear. But now suppose that I, carrying Manderson's clothes and shoes, had opened that door again and gone in my shirt-sleeves and socks to enter one of the empty rooms. The moonlight was flooding the corridor through the end window. Even if my face were concealed, nobody could mistake my standing figure for Manderson's. Martin might be going about the house in his silent way. Bunner might come out of his bedroom. One of the servants, who were supposed to be in bed, might come round the corner from the other passage. I had found Celestine prowling about quite as late as it was then. None of these things was very likely, but they were all too likely for me. They were uncertainties. Shut off from the household in Manderson's room, I knew exactly what I had to face. As I lay in my clothes in Manderson's bed, and listened for the almost inaudible breathing through the open door, I felt far more ease of mind, terrible as my anxiety was, than I had felt since I saw the dead body on the turf. I even congratulated myself that I had had the chance, through Mrs. Manderson's speaking to me, of tightening one of the screws in my scheme by repeating the statement about my having been sent to Southampton. Marlowe looked at Trent, who nodded as one who should say that his point was met. "'As for Southampton,' pursued Marlowe, "'you know what I did when I got there, I have no doubt. I had decided to take Manderson's story about the mysterious Harris and act it out on my own lines. It was a carefully prepared lie, better than anything I could improvise. I even went so far as to get through a trunk call to the hotel at Southampton from the library before starting, and ask if Harris was there. As I expected, he wasn't. "'Was that why you telephoned?' Trent inquired quickly. "'The reason for telephoning?' was to get myself into an attitude in which Martin couldn't see my face or anything but the jacket and hat, yet which was a natural and familiar attitude. But while I was about it, it was obviously better to make a genuine call. If I had simply pretended to be telephoning, the people at the exchange could have told you at once that there hadn't been a call from White Gables that night." "'One of the first things I did was to make that inquiry,' said Trent. "'That telephone call, and the wire you sent from Southampton to the dead man, to say Harris hadn't turned up and you were returning, both those appealed to me.' A constrained smile lighted Marlowe's face for a moment. "'I don't know that there's anything more to tell. I returned to Marlstone.' and faced your friend the detective with such nerve as I had left. The worst was when I heard you had been put on the case. No, that wasn't the worst. The worst was when I saw you walk out of the shrubbery the next day, coming away from the shed where I had laid the body. For one ghastly moment I thought you were going to give me in charge on the spot. Now I've told you everything. You don't look so terrible." He closed his eyes, and then there was a short silence. Then Trent got suddenly to his feet. "'Cross-examination?' inquired Marlowe, looking at him gravely. "'Not at all,' said Trent, stretching his long limbs. "'Only stiffness of the legs. I don't want to ask any questions. I believe what you have told us. I don't believe it simply because I always liked your face, or because it saves awkwardness, which are the most usual reasons for believing a person, but because my vanity will have it that no man could lie to me steadily for an hour without my perceiving it. 
your story is an extraordinary one. But Manderson was an extraordinary man, and so are you. You acted like a lunatic in doing what you did, but I quite agree with you that if you had acted like a sane man, you wouldn't have had the hundredth part of a dog's chance, with a judge and jury. One thing is beyond dispute on any reading of the affair. You are a man of courage. The color rushed into Marlowe's face, and he hesitated for words. Before he could speak, Mr. Cupples arose with a dry cough. "'For my part,' he said, "'I never supposed you guilty for a moment.' Marlowe turned to him in grateful amazement, Trent with an incredulous stare. "'But,' pursued Mr. Cupples, holding up his hand, "'there is one question which I should like to put.' Marlowe bowed, saying nothing. "'Suppose,' said Mr. Cupples, "'that someone else had been suspected of the crime and put upon trial. "'What would you have done?' "'I think my duty was clear. "'I should have gone with my story to the lawyers for the defence "'and put myself in their hands.' "'Trent laughed aloud. "'Now that the thing was over, "'his spirits were rapidly becoming ungovernable.' "'I can see their faces,' he said. "'As a matter of fact, though, nobody else was even in danger. "'There wasn't a shred of evidence against anyone. "'I looked up Murch at the yard this morning, "'and he told me he had come round to Bunner's view, "'that it was a case of revenge on the part of some American black-hand gang. "'So there's the end of the Manderson case. "'Holy suffering Moses!' "'What an ass a man can make of himself when he thinks he's being preternaturally clever!' He seized the bulky envelope from the table and stuffed it into the heart of the fire. "'There's for you, old friend. For want of you the world's course will not fail. But look here, it's getting late, nearly seven, and Couples and I have an appointment at half-past. We must go. Mr. Marlowe, good-bye.' He looked into the other's eyes. "'I am a man who has worked hard to put a rope round your neck. Considering the circumstances, I don't know whether you will blame me. Will you shake hands?' End of Part 2 Chapter 14 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 15 of Trent's Last Case. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Trent's Last Case. Chapter 15. The Last Straw. What was that you said about our having an appointment at half past seven? asked Mr. Cupples, as the two came out of the great gateway of the pile of flats. Have we such an appointment? "'Certainly we have,' replied Trent. "'You are dining with me. "'Only one thing can properly celebrate this occasion, "'and that is a dinner for which I pay. "'No, no, I asked you first. "'I have got right down to the bottom of a case that must be unique, "'a case that has troubled even my mind for over a year, "'and if that isn't a good reason for standing at dinner, "'I don't know what is.' Couples, we will not go to my club. This is to be a festival, and to be seen in a London club in a state of pleasurable emotion is more than enough to shatter any man's career. Besides that, the dinner there is always the same, or at least they always make it taste the same. I know not how. The eternal dinner at my club hath bored millions of members like me, and shall bore. But to-night, let the feast be spread in vain, so far as we are concerned. We will not go where the satraps throng the hall. We will go to Shepherd's. Who is Shepherd? asked Mr. Cupples mildly, as they proceeded up Victoria Street. His companion went with an unnatural lightness, and a policeman, observing his face, smiled indulgently at a look of happiness which he could only attribute to alcohol. "'Who is Shepherd? echoed Trent, 
with bitter emphasis, that question, if you will pardon me for saying so, couples, is thoroughly characteristic of the spirit of aimless inquiry prevailing in this restless day. I suggest our dining at Shepherd's, and instantly you fold your arms and demand, in a frenzy of intellectual pride, to know who Shepherd is before you will cross the threshold of Shepherd's. I am not going to pander to the vices of the modern mind. Shepherd's is a place where one can dine. I do not know Shepherd. It never occurred to me that Shepherd existed. Probably he is a myth of totemistic origin. All I know is that you can get a bit of saddle of mutton at Shepherd's that has made many an American visitor curse the day that Christopher Columbus was born. Taxi? A cab rolled smoothly to the curb, and the driver received his instruction with a majestic nod. "'Another reason I have for suggesting shepherds,' continued Trent, feverishly lighting a cigarette, "'is that I am going to be married to the most wonderful woman in the world. I trust the connection of my ideas is clear.' "'You are going to marry Mabel,' cried Mr. Cupples. "'My dear friend, what good news that is! Shake hands, Trent. This is glorious. I congratulate you both from the bottom of my heart. And may I say, I don't want to interrupt your flow of high spirits, which is very natural indeed, and I remember being just the same in similar circumstances long ago, but may I say how earnestly I have hoped for this. Mabel has seen so much unhappiness, yet she is surely a woman formed in the great purpose of humanity to be the best influence in the life of a good man. But I did not know her mind as regarded yourself. Your mind I have known for some time. Mr. Cupples went on with a twinkle in his eye that would have done credit to the worldliest of creatures. I saw it at once when you were both dining at my house and you sat listening to Professor Petmiller and looking at her. Some of us older fellows have our wits about us still, my dear boy. Mabel says she knew it before that, replied Trent, with a slightly crestfallen air, and I thought I was acting the part of a person who was not mad about her to the life. Well, I never was any good at dissembling. I shouldn't wonder if even old Pepmiller noticed something through his double convex lenses. But however crazy I may have been as an undeclared suitor, I am going to be much worse now. Here's the place. He broke off as the cab rushed down a side street and swung round a corner into a broad and populous thoroughfare. We are there already. The cab drew up. "'Here we are,' said Trent, as he paid the man, and led Mr. Cupples into a long panelled room, set with many tables, and filled with a hum of talk. "'This is the house of fulfilment of craving. This is the bower with the roses around it. I see there are three bookmakers eating pork at my favourite table. We will have that one in the opposite corner.' He conferred earnestly with a waiter, while Mr. Cupples, in a pleasant meditation, warmed himself before the great fire. "'The wine here,' Trent resumed, as they seated themselves, "'is almost certainly made out of grapes. What shall we drink?' Mr. Cupples came out of his reverie. "'I think,' he said, "'I will have milk and soda-water.' "'Speak lower,' urged Trent. "'The head waiter has a weak heart, and he may hear you.' milk and soda-water. Couples, you may think you have a strong constitution, and I don't say you have not, but I warn you that this habit of mixing drinks has been the death of many a robuster man than you. Be wise in time. Fill high the bowl with sammy and wine. Leave soda to the Turkish hordes. Here comes our food. He gave another order to the waiter, who ranged the dishes before them and darted away. Trent was, it seemed, a respected customer. "'I have sent,' he said, "'for wine that I know, and I hope you will try it. 
if you have taken a vow then in the name of all the teetotal saints drink water which stands at your elbow but don't seek a cheap notoriety by demanding milk and soda i have never taken any pledge said mr cupples examining his mutton with a favourable eye i simply don't care about wine i bought a bottle once and drank it to see what it was like and it made me ill but very likely it was bad wine i will taste some of yours as it is your dinner and i do assure you my dear trent i should like to do something unusual to show how strongly i feel on the present occasion i have not been so delighted for many years to think he reflected aloud as the waiter filled his glass of the manderson mystery disposed of the innocent exculpated and your own and mabel's happiness crowned all coming upon me together i drink to you my dear friend and mr cupples took a very small sip of the wine you have a very great nature said trent much moved your outward semblance doth belie your soul's immensity i should have expected as soon to see an elephant conducting at the opera as you drinking my health dear cupples may his beak retain ever that delicate rose stain no curse it all he broke out surprising a shade of discomfort that fitted over his companion's face as he tasted the wine again i have no business to meddle with your tastes i apologize you shall have what you want even if it causes the head waiter to perish in his pride when mr cupples had been supplied with his monastic drink and the waiter had retired trent looked across the table with significance in this babble of many conversations he said we can speak as freely as if we were on a bare hillside the waiter is whispering soft nothings into the ear of the young woman at the pay desk we are alone what do you think of that interview this afternoon he began to dine with an appetite without pausing in the task of cutting his mutton into very small pieces mr cupples replied the most curious feature of it in my judgment was the irony of the situation we both held the clue to that mad hatred of manderson's which marlowe found so mysterious we knew of his jealous obsession which knowledge we withheld as was very proper if only in consideration of mabel's feelings marlowe will never know of what he was suspected by that person strange nearly all of us i venture to think move unconsciously among a network of opinions often quite erroneous which other people entertain about us with regard to marlowe's story it appeared to me entirely straightforward and not in its essential features especially remarkable once we have admitted as we surely must that in the case of manderson we have to deal with a more or less disordered mind it was mr bunner i think you said who told you of his rooted and apparently hereditary temper of suspicious jealousy when the pressure of his business labors brought on mental derangement that abnormality increased until it dominated him entirely trent laughed loudly not especially remarkable he said i confess that the affair struck me as a little unusual only in the development of the details argued mr cupples what is there abnormal in the essential facts a madman conceives a crazy suspicion he hatches a cunning plot against his fancied injurer it involves his own destruction put thus what is there that any man with the least knowledge of the ways of lunatics would call remarkable turn now to marlowe's proceedings he finds himself in a perilous position from which though he is innocent telling the truth will not save him is that an unheard-of situation he escapes by means of a bold and ingenious piece of deception that seems to me a thing that might happen every day and probably does so he attacked his now unrecognizable mutton 
"'I should like to know,' said Trent, after an elementary pause in the conversation, "'whether there is anything that ever happened on the face of the earth "'that you could not represent as quite ordinary and commonplace "'by such a line of argument as that. "'You may say what you like, "'but the idea of impersonating Manderson in those circumstances "'was an extraordinarily ingenious idea.' "'Ingenious, certainly,' replied Mr. Cupples. "'Extraordinarily so? No. "'In those circumstances, your own words, "'it was really not strange that it should occur to a clever man. "'It lay almost on the surface of the situation. "'Marlowe was famous for his imitation of Manderson's voice. "'He had a talent for acting. "'He knew the ways of the establishment intimately.' I grant you that the idea was brilliantly carried out, but everything favored it. As for the essential idea, I do not place it, as regards ingenuity, in the same class with, for example, the idea of utilizing the force of recoil in a discharged firearm to actuate the mechanism of ejecting and reloading. I do, however, admit, as I did at the outset, that in respect of details the case had unusual features. It developed a high degree of complexity. "'Did it really strike you in that way?' inquired Trent, with desperate sarcasm. "'The affair became complicated,' proceeded Mr. Cupples, quite unmoved, because after Marlowe's suspicions were awakened, a second subtle mind came in to interfere with the plans of the first. That sort of duel often happens in business and politics, but less frequently, I imagine, in the world of crime. One disturbing reflection was left on my mind by what we learned today. If Marlowe had suspected nothing, and had walked into the trap, he would almost certainly have been hanged. Now, how often may not a plan to throw the guilt of murder on an innocent person have been practiced successfully? There are, I imagine, numbers of cases in which the accused, being found guilty on circumstantial evidence, have died protesting their innocence. I shall never approve again of a death sentence imposed in a case decided upon such evidence. "'I have never done so, for my part,' said Trent. "'To hang in such cases seems to me flying in the face of the perfectly obvious and sound principle expressed in the saying that you never can tell. I agree with the American jurist who lays it down that we should not hang a yellow dog for stealing jam on circumstantial evidence, not even if he has jam all over his nose. As for attempts being made by malevolent persons to fix crimes upon innocent men, of course it is constantly happening. Mr. Cupples mused a few moments. "'We know,' he said, "'from the things Mabel and Mr. Bunner told you, "'what may be termed the spiritual truth underlying this matter, "'the insane depth of jealous hatred which Manderson concealed. "'We can understand that he was capable of such a scheme, "'but as a rule it is in the task of penetrating to the spiritual truth "'that the administration of justice breaks down.' Sometimes that truth is deliberately concealed, as in Manderson's case. Sometimes I think it is concealed because simple people are actually unable to express it, and nobody else divines it. The law certainly does not shine when it comes to a case requiring much delicacy of perception, said Trent. It goes wrong easily enough over the commonplace criminal. As for the people with temperaments who get mixed up in legal proceedings, they must feel as if they were in a forest of apes, whether they win or lose. Well, I dare say it's good for them and their sort to have their noses rubbed in reality now and again. But what would twelve red-faced realities in a jury-box have done to Marlowe? His story would, as he says, have been a great deal worse than no defense at all. It's not as if there were a single piece of evidence in support of his tale. Can't you imagine how the prosecution would tear it to rags? Can't you see the judge simply taking it in his stride when it came to the summing up? 
and the jury, you've served on juries, I expect, in their room snorting with indignation over the feebleness of the lie, telling each other it was the clearest case they ever heard of, and that they'd have thought better of him if he hadn't lost his nerve at the crisis, and had cleared off with the swag, as he intended. Imagine yourself on that jury, not knowing Marlowe, and trembling with indignation at the record unrolled before you, cupidity, murder, robbery, sudden cowardice, shameless, impenitent, desperate lying. Why, you and I believed him to be guilty until— I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, interjected Mr. Cupples, laying down his knife and fork. I was most careful, when we talked it all over the other night, to say nothing indicating such a belief. I was always certain that he was innocent. You said something of the sort at Marlowe's just now. I wondered what on earth you could mean. Certain that he was innocent. How can you be certain? You are generally more careful about terms than that, Cupples. I said certain, Mr. Cupples repeated, firmly. Trent shrugged his shoulders. If you really were, after reading my manuscript, and discussing the whole thing as we did, he rejoined, then I can only say that you must have totally renounced all trust in the operations of the human reason, an attitude which, while it is bad Christianity and also infernal nonsense, is oddly enough bad positivism, too, unless I misunderstand that system. Why, man, let me say a word. Mr. Cupples interposed again, folding his hands above his plate. I assure you I am far from abandoning reason. I am certain he is innocent, and I always was certain of it, because of something that I know and knew from the very beginning. You asked me just now to imagine myself on the jury at Marlowe's trial. That would be an unprofitable exercise of the mental powers because I know that I should be present in another capacity. I should be in the witness-box giving evidence for the defense. You said just now, if there were a single piece of evidence in support of his tale, there is, and it is my evidence, and, he added quietly, it is conclusive. He took up his knife and fork, and went contentedly on with his dinner. The pallor of excitement had turned Trent to marble, while Mr. Cupples led laboriously up to this statement. At the last word the blood rushed to his face again, and he struck the table with an unnatural laugh. "'It can't be!' he exploded. "'It's something you fancied, something you dreamed after one of those debauches of soda and milk. You can't really mean that all the time I was working on the case down there— you knew Marlowe was innocent. Mr. Cupples, busy with his last mouthful, nodded brightly. He made an end of eating, wiped his sparse moustache, and then leaned forward over the table. It's very simple, he said. I shot Manderson myself. I am afraid I startled you. Trent heard the voice of Mr. Cupples say, he forced himself out of his stupefaction, like a diver striking upward for the surface, and with a rigid movement raised his glass. But half of the wine splashed upon the cloth, and he put it carefully down again, untasted. He drew a deep breath, which was exhaled, in a laugh wholly without merriment. "'Go on,' he said. "'It was not murder,' began Mr. Cupples, slowly measuring off inches with a fork on the edge of the table, I will tell you the whole story. On that Sunday night I was taking my before-bedtime constitutional, having set out from the hotel about quarter-past ten. I went along the field path that runs behind White Gables, cutting off the great curve of the road, and came out on the road nearly opposite that gate that is just by the eighth hole on the golf course. Then I turned in there, meaning to walk along the turf to the edge of the cliff and go back that way. I had only gone a few steps when I heard the car coming, 
and then I heard it stop near the gate. I saw Manderson at once. Do you remember my telling you that I had seen him once alive after our quarrel in front of the hotel? Well, this was the time. You asked me if I had, and I did not care to tell a falsehood. A slight groan came from Trent. He drank a little wine, and said stonily, "'Go on, please.' "'It was, as you know,' pursued Mr. Cupples, "'a moonlit night, but I was in shadow under the trees by the stone wall, and anyhow they could not suppose there was anyone near them. I heard all that passed, just as Marlowe has narrated it to us, and I saw the car go off toward Bishopsbridge. I did not see Manderson's face as it went, because his back was to me, but he shook his left hand at the car with extraordinary violence, greatly to my amazement. Then I waited for him to go back to White Gables, as I did not want to meet him again, but he did not go. He opened the gate through which I had just passed, and he stood there on the turf of the green, quite still. His head was bent, his arms hung at his sides, and he looked somehow rigid. For a few moments he remained in this tense attitude. Then, all of a sudden, his right arm moved swiftly, and his hand was at the pocket of his overcoat. I saw his face raised in the moonlight, the teeth bared, and the eyes glittering, and all at once I knew that the man was mad. Almost as quickly as that flashed across my mind, something else flashed in the moonlight. He held the pistol before him, pointing at his breast. Now, I may say here I shall always be doubtful whether Manderson intended to kill himself then. Marlowe naturally thinks so, knowing nothing of my intervention. But I think it quite likely he only meant to wound himself, and to charge Marlowe with attempted murder and robbery. At that moment, however, I assumed it was suicide. Before I knew what I was doing, I had leapt out of the shadows and seized his arm. He shook me off with a furious snarling noise, giving me a terrific blow in the chest, and presented the revolver at my head. But I seized his wrists before he could fire, and clung with all my strength. You remember how bruised and scratched they were. I knew I was fighting for my own life now, for murder was in his eyes. We struggled like two beasts, without an articulate word, I holding his pistol hand down and keeping a grip on the other. I never dreamed that I had the strength for such an encounter. Then, with a perfectly instinctive movement, I never knew I meant to do it, I flung away his free hand and clutched like lightning at the weapon tearing it from his fingers. By a miracle it did not go off. I darted back a few steps, he sprang at my throat like a wild cat, and I fired blindly in his face. He would have been about a yard away, I suppose. His knees gave way instantly, and he fell in a heap on the turf. I flung the pistol down and bent over him. The heart's motion ceased under my hand. I knelt there, staring, struck motionless, and I don't know how long it was before I heard the noise of the car returning. Trent, all the time that Marlowe paced that green, with the moonlight on his white and working face, I was within a few yards of him, crouching in the shadow of the firs by the ninth tee. I dared not show myself. I was thinking. My public quarrel with Manderson the same morning was, I suspected, the talk of the hotel. I assure you that every horrible possibility of the situation for me had rushed across my mind the moment I saw Manderson fall. I became cunning. I knew what I must do. I must get back to the hotel as fast as I could, get in somehow unperceived, and play a part to save myself. I must never tell a word to anyone. Of course I was assuming that Marlowe would tell everyone how he had found the body. I knew he would suppose it was suicide. 
I thought every one would suppose so. When Marlowe began at last to lift the body, I stole away down the wall and got out into the road by the clubhouse, where he could not see me. I felt perfectly cool and collected. I crossed the road, climbed the fence, and ran across the meadow to pick up the field path I had come by that runs to the hotel behind White Gables. I got back to the hotel very much out of breath. "'Out of breath,' repeated Trent, mechanically, still staring at his companion as if hypnotized. "'I had had a sharp run,' said Mr. Cupples. "'Well, approaching the hotel from the back, I could see into the writing-room through the open window. There was nobody in there, so I climbed over the sill, walked to the bell and rang it, and then sat down to write a letter I had meant to write the next day.' I saw by the clock that it was a little past eleven. When the waiter answered the bell, I asked for a glass of milk and a postage stamp. Soon afterwards I went up to bed, but I could not sleep. Mr. Cupples, having nothing more to say, ceased speaking. He looked in mild surprise at Trent, who now sat silent, supporting his bent head in his hands. "'He could not sleep,' murmured Trent at last, in a hollow tone. "'A frequent result of overexertion during the day. Nothing to be alarmed about.' He was silent again, then looked up with a pale face. "'Couples, I am cured. I will never touch a crime mystery again. The Manderson affair shall be Philip Trent's last case.' His high-blown pride at length breaks under him. Trent's smile suddenly returned. I could have borne everything but that last revelation of the impotence of human reason. Couples, I have absolutely nothing left to say except this. You have beaten me. I drink your health in a spirit of self-abasement, and you shall pay for dinner. End of chapter 15 End of Trent's Last Case by E.C. Bentley Recording by Kirsten Weber